maybe today we'll talk a little bit more about some of the individual works of art and, and handle your questions um, rather than doing a suggested tour. The exhibition is laid out this way. You come in here, you go that way, and you go around, and you go back out, and you, and you head into to Hamburg. So it's basically you come this way, and, and you're driven around. I think as we explained in a couple of times as we've been talking about the exhibition, uh, Don, Donnie calls the horizontal kind of uh, sub-themes that are running run this way. So as you come in, you're looking at oil paintings in, in China, in Shanghai, from kind of 18, the earliest one is 1849, and the latest one's around 1940, 1950. So we're kind of looking at oil paintings on this little band right here. The next is uh, women and, and popular media, popular culture. On the far end is ink painting. So there, there are various ways to look at how you, you do your tour, the kind of the sub-themes, but the main route is coming in this way and, and going, going around. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, one of our, we didn't do the, all the scrims and fancy things that we've done in other exhibitions. Our main kind of support material for this, we just decided to do maps because it's so much about the city. <coughs> Excuse me, we thought it was important to have maps. So we have two maps. We have this one uh, from around 1900 and we have another one from 1937. These are actual maps that we then uh, we purchased the rights to use and I got permission to, to add these images to them. So these are maps from, this is a map from 1900. It's an actual map that's been, uh, that we purchased the digital rights to use, and the same with the one in 1937. So they give some pretty interesting information about identifying what Shanghai is and was. Um, in 1900, so there's a map of China and kind of a rough idea where Shanghai is. And I think this is helpful with your audiences as you come in and talk about that, so where Shanghai is. And then what Shanghai has become so it's now this huge uh, area, and then what you know, the, what old Shanghai, where it was on, in that in that kind of general area. So you have it at the mouth of the Yangtze River, and you show the Yangtze coming up here, and the Huangpu River running through, and then on the actual maps, um, the map thankfully is clear enough that you can read a lot of the names of the buildings and, and such on it. So as you go and look look through, you now we identify some of the ones that are mentioned in the various labels and didactic panels. And we found early period photographs of them and actually applied them here. So the Yiping Xiang restaurant, which is talked about in the, in the, the drawings for the, the uh, lithographs, that's a 1900 photograph of that. Here's a silversmith shop, so the silversmith, the silversmith may not be that exact one, but a silversmith shop on Nanjing Road, Trinity Church, which is one of the big sites, Garden Bridge, of course, that's a big site. Um, here's the old city, so the old city of Shanghai, and again, that's one of those things that we're trying to remove uh, a myth that Shanghai was not, there wasn't much there before the uh, British arrived. There was, a, you know, this was the walled city and the images of the walled city, it was pretty pack, packed, there were a lot of people there. So a couple of images of the walled city and the Bund and early images of the Bund. And uh, you know, things that we now think of as, as streets, Yangjiangbang Creek was, uh, it was a creek and now it's a road, the racetrack, Bubbling Wall Road, those kinds of things are mentioned on the map. If you get up a little closer, there are items of kind of uh, San Francisco interest, for example. So if you get up close, right here is the Pacific Mail Steamship Company's offices. So that was a company that started in San Francisco in 1867 and became a big deal with the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869. And was, that was big back and forth between San Francisco and Shanghai. So that, it's actually a bit, an important enough site that it's on this map. So there are things like that to talk about as well, kind of the Shanghai-San Francisco connections and such. And you shouldn't do like what I just did and touch the map, because these are actually going to print. They take fingerprints very, very easily, and Stephen's going to cut my hand off if you've seen, if you've seen, seen me do that. OK, does that kind of give you an idea? The map, I think, is, gives you an idea of what Shanghai was like physically and, um, and such. And there are a lot of these maps, and we chose these because we thought they were kind of the most relevant for the two periods, the beginning period and, and the high times period that we talked about. All right? Photographs are from around 1900. So we didn't put any modern photographs up here. Now, all of these are, are old photographs. I can't, most of them were dated around 1900. Su uh, the, uh, Sujo Creek? So Sujo Creek is, is pretty clear once, you, when you're, once you're there. So it runs, it's not a canal though, it's a creek. So it runs right through and it was the, it was the division between the American concession and the, and the British concession. 
So again, as we were talking about how Shanghai worked, the American concession and the British concession combined and became the international settlement. And that had a government that was elected from local, local residents, non-Chinese residents, local residents. And that's one of the reasons why Shanghai was a place of refuge for Chinese during the Taipings and all that is it was separate from China. So they could, they could flee there, they could find refuge there. The French settlement, which is this area here, and then ultimately continued out into a, a broader area, the French settlement was separate. It wasn't part of the international settlement. So it had its, it was more like Hong Kong. It had a governor and was run, run somewhat separately. So what else? It's basically a pretty, pretty good a, a start from the map. I mean, it gives you an, I hope it gives people an idea of where, what we're talking about, where we are. Um, these, the pieces from the Peabody Essex Museum, as, uh, they're, they're interesting in, in all kinds of ways, of course. And we have images of, you know, here's an earlier, slightly earlier image than that one. And here you're look, mainly looking at um, sailing craft rather than the steam powered craft that are down there. As objects, they are interesting. I mean, they were done by Chinese artists um, for Western patrons. They were done for the, those people who were trading in, in Shanghai. They show the, the bun in that area being developed. And they, you know, as the buildings change, the paintings change, and so on. But as an object, they're also fascinating. As we were looking at these, uh, as we were unpacking them and condition reporting them, <coughs> if you look at the frames, they look like European frames, right? But if you, if you look at the backs of them, this is all mortise and tenon, strict Chinese joinery. This is not a miter joint than like a Western frame would be. This is, this is uh, these are frames made, these are original frames, except for that one. These are the original frames to the paintings, and they're definitely made in China at the time of the painting. So as an object, this, this is a whole object, the painting and the frame, uh, would have been done at, at, at the period of its own the creation. It would have been that way since it was painted. So they're interesting in that way. And then, of course, there's mementos for these sea captains that were running around in Shanghai. They're quite precise on their details. So you get the flags that tell you who's where, so here's an American flag here, and so on and so forth. Here's the customs house and these various kinds of office buildings, uh, residences, and um, warehouses that were on the, uh, on the bond at that time. Okay on that? We're gonna run 35 minutes in front of every painting, right? No. So here, the, the, the change is pretty clear. Uh, steamships, so between, you know, somewhere around 1850 and the time this painting was done, in the mid to late 1860s, we have steamships showing up. Also, this boat, maybe this boat, certainly this boat, so this one and this one, I would say for sure, are opium hulks. So this is where opium is being sold in the harbor. And there are different scale of steamships. So here's a fairly large one. Here's a small one. Obviously, that was not going to go across the Pacific. So there are, there are ships there for local, kind of local uh, commerce. And then people who live there on these little boats in the background and so on and so forth. So quite a bit of uh, detail. And the gangs of Garden Bridge was over here on this side and such. All right. And on those. So all of you have read the, and memorized the catalog, right? <laughs> <laughs> so silver is, silver is fun. Um, what's the Chinese term for bank? <laughs> what does that mean? Bureau, Bureau of Silver, so, uh, and that gets into this whole thing about globalization and, and silver and, and, and the role it played in globalization. Silver really wasn't used much in, for art, as a medium for art. Um, it was not a metal that was used for art in China much at all. You see some silver inlays in very early, kind of bronze, late Bronze Age materials, but silver wasn't much used as an art, as a material for art. But starting really in the 1500s, Silver was the basis of international, uh, uh, pre-modern international economic system, inter international economic system. So silver being taken by the Spanish in their colonies in the Americas, uh, taken from the Incas and such, the Aztecs was then melted down, made into coins. And these coins were the means of exchange for buying porcelains and silks and whatever, uh, trading. I mean, it was a whole international kind of basis for, for an economic system, kind of a pre-modern economic system. So what happens in the early 1800s to that silver system? This is globalization. And that's one of the kind of foundations for this exhibition. If you think about Mexican independence, independence running throughout the, the Americas, the, the Spanish colonies. So these colonies become independent. And the supply of silver, the supply of silver coming from American colonies goes away. So up until the 1820s and 1830s, the British were buying tea with silver dollars. That wasn't a problem. They had a, 
but that source stops. Uh, there's no more new silver. So the British have a problem of what do they buy tea with, and of course what they do is they enforce the importation of opium, and that becomes the Opium Wars, which becomes the foundations of the tree ports in Shanghai. So there's a, there's a story, an international story, that goes with monetary exchange and globalization, of an existing monetary system that comes apart because of events in the Americas that leads to Shanghai becoming a treaty port. So that's an interesting kind of two stories about silver, this kind of thing that was made as an, an item for by Chinese craftsmen working in Shanghai for the traders, the same as these paintings. But there's also the story of silver and the role that it played in, uh, in the foundations of Shanghai and then as a monetary system uh, throughout the, the, a lot of the history that we talk about Shanghai. The Chinese used the silver standard for their, as their currency until 1935, and we'll talk about that later. So the Chinese actually had, like we had the gold standard in the US for a long time, the Chinese used silver standard for their currency and they backed their currency with real value until 1935. And throughout the period between you know, this time, 1840s and 1935, the Chinese government did not have a monopoly on money. So they didn't print all the money. And actually American, the Spanish colonial American silver coinage was a preferred medium of exchange. So that was money was moving back and forth. Uh, it was Spanish money from the Americas, interesting. I just realized, actually, so we're still, we are still in the beginning section, late 1800s, but interestingly, the, the beginning section has views of Shanghai, of the city itself, while we are entering the section where we are now having portraits of the Shanghai residents. And specifically, we are focusing on the Chinese residents, while over there, we're actually focusing on buildings of Western merchants. So an interesting juxtaposition that just came, popped into my head. And so this wonderful hand scroll illustration of one of the um, elite Chinese in Shanghai at this time, uh, Wu Dacheng, or his, with his nickname Ke Zhai. And this hand scroll illustrates his Chinese bronze ritual collection. And then followed by rubbings of each piece, which uh, when we unpack this, we were with the uh, painting curator from the Shanghai Museum and also with our head of conservation. And we were just trying to figure out what is the medium for these rubbings? Like, were they simply rubbings? I don't, I'm sure you're familiar with um, the tradition of rubbing. Um, but we also realized that some of the inscriptions were rubbings that were then cut out and then pasted onto this hand scroll. And the painting curator from the Shanghai Museum believes that the actual objects themselves, these rubbings, they are possibly lithographed and then later enhanced by hand. So that is an interesting new development for this hand scroll. And also, this uh, vessel right here to the right of the figure, it's been identified as a piece in our collection, so it's a great opportunity that we get to highlight that and bring it out of storage for the, this exhibition. This time, we also see the beginnings of, the fem of females, of women being um, visualized in, or actually publicized, because these are original Russian ink drawings that were later that served as a manuscript for photolithographed prints. And now that you see them in person, you can actually see the sheer size of them. And so these, lith these um, lithograph prints were then bound into a pictorial, so a, an illustrated journal. Um, and they are, you know, of, they are of a considerable size. I don't know what the equivalent would be today, but it's not a standard book size like that. It's a little bit larger. And they are just fun to look at. You know, they are um, associated with modern technology. They are enjoying the latest forms of entertainment that uh, you know, was introduced from the West, but yet it was introduced at such a fast pace. And this is also, we see the beginnings of an association with um, the city of Shanghai, with all that was considered modern, and with the Chinese woman being one of the first to embrace all of these new forms of technology and entertainment. And that trend will continue into the 1920s and 1930s. We're glad to have the map right there of uh, the 1900 map because 
um, we try to, whenever we mention a certain place in any one of our labels, hopefully you can you know, direct people to the map and have them, it would be a fun game to have them try to find all these different places. And so one here, this is the image of a group of women being served a meal at Yi Pin Xiang, the uh, Western style uh, restaurant that was located, located on Fuzhou Road. And so you know, one of the novelties of this Western style restaurant is that each room, there were 30, a little over 30 rooms, was decorated in, with Western decor and they enjoyed using knives and forks on a menu of was it steak, pork chops, pudding, champagne, beer, and champagne was actually very popular to the Chinese in the late 1800s. And I think that's a champagne, two champagne bottles right there, one right there. And the interesting thing about this image is we have published images in other, um, during my research that I've seen published images of the same room, but with different characters in it, with different people in it. And so in a way, it seems like um, you can imagine either the artist having access to the room and painting it in, on site, or because, um, for example, the artist of this work, Wu Youru, he not only worked for the, one of the periodicals, which is the Dian Shi Jai pictorial, he also later started his own Fei Yinge pictor pictorial. But um, there isn't much on whether or not you know, he was contracted to just one uh, publishing company. And so I can imagine, or there is a possibility that his image, this view here, became a stock image that could be then recycled in other pictorials. Does indicate where um, you know either a mistake was made or the artist changed his mind, and so it was corrected over and then redrawn. It's, it's yeah, it's basically a 19th century whiteout, and it. I now understood why it exists on this manuscript because I. It's not. It wasn't lithography exactly that was used to produce the prints later on. It was photolithography. And so um, if it was just normal lithography, the original drawing would have been made on the stone, and so any corrections would be made on the stone, and so you wouldn't necessarily have evidence unless you had the stone. But in photolithography, you're actually projecting an image of this drawing on paper onto the stone surface through a photoemulsion. And so all the corrections had to be made here first before it's then projected onto the stone. And so that's the technical difference. Okay. Called Shanghai School of Painting or Hai Pai. And you now have a pretty good idea of Shanghai as a, as a place of refuge during the Taiping rebellions and the kind of uh, area, the turmoil of the of late 19th century China. I, you may have heard me say this before, but uh, one of the graduates, the students that I was a fellow graduate student with at Columbia was a, a demographer, and her study was on population change in China. And you know, globalization, there were a lot of effects of globalization, but one of the effects of globalization or exchange during the, the early part of the Qing was the introduction of what would be called marginal crops into China. So things like squash and pumpkins and so on and so forth. So what that allowed was, you know, the traditional Chinese agriculture system was rice, rice-based. But that allowed for people to actually settle into areas and farm areas that they hadn't been able to farm before. And the Chinese population during the Qing, it was a backward time in many ways. I mean, the Chinese government was inward looking and didn't do anything. But it was also a period of peace and economic growth and population growth. And by 1850, uh, demographers were estimating that the Chinese population was around 400 million. That was more than the, the technologies of the time could support. So the agricultural technologies of 1850 China could not support 400 million people. So from kind of 1850 to the turn of the century, nearly 10% of the Chinese population, over 30 million people died in one way or another, be that famine, starvation, the rebellions, the Taiping rebellions, and the whole of the Lower Yangtze River Basin was just in total turmoil. 
So a lot of the major cities that we think of as the great centers of uh, art and culture of the late Ming and, and throughout the Qing, Suzhou, Nanjing, Hangzhou, you name them, they were just, you know, the, not, not, the Taipings came through and they were destroyed. So these people were homeless. They moved, they, they fled. And a lot of them, if you were wealthy enough, if you were lucky enough, you ended up in Shanghai. And you ended up in Shanghai with the, the means to live properly in Shanghai. And those were the artists that came there. And those were also the kind of foundations for the, the population that created all the goods that were being created there. But also a lot of artists, I mean, important artists came there. And a number of them from Yangzhou and other areas. And um, it became an area of, of artistic production and artistic changes in, art, in, in the arts. But it was, it was not like the old amateur ideal of the literati of previous generations. These were artists who were painting for a living. These were professional artists. And they were responding very directly to the taste of the, the wealthy merchants of Shanghai, the wealthy Chinese merchants of Shanghai and others. So they were not doing these subtle kind of intentionally um, subtle or overly subtle or awkward paintings of the educated elite. They were doing big, bold, strong, powerful uh, paintings they were decorative. They, meant to be, they were meant to be displayed in the homes of these, the large homes of these wealthy and educated, wealthy elite, not wealthy elite, the merchants of Shanghai. I'll say this right. So we get these paintings, uh, like Wu Chang Shua. Uh, we get paintings like, like this, these big, bold, bright, uh, very bold, bold kind of brushwork. Not at all like what you'd think of a literati landscape. We also have, at this time, the beginnings of that story of the back and forth between Shanghai and Japan. So Japan in 1868 uh, opens its doors, the Meiji Restoration, Japan opens its doors. And it, about the same time that Shanghai is doing the same thing. Uh, Japan did it more willingly. Shanghai was a treaty port. And you know, the, the, the means of uh, the relationships were different. But, Shanghai, but Japan really tried to modernize, made a real serious effort to modernize and was moving ahead of China in that area. So the Chinese began to go, particularly from Shanghai, to Japan, both for business but also to study art, uh, to, to, to kind of get an idea of what modernization looked like in Japan, what Western art looked like through the filter of Japan. And you see that in, in artists like this. This is an artist who actually you know, studied in Japan. And you can see you know, horizon line, sun coming up over that, the kind of coloration. And such, it was not unlike what you might see in, in kind of late 19th century paintings being done in Japan. So there was that kind of back and forth, a different kind of relationship as we think about the relationship between Japanese and Chinese painting. In this case, the Chinese were going to Japan to study new innovations and in, in, uh, arts there. So what happens, an artist, uh, a, a collector like Wu Da Cheng, a man of, who had been part of the um, imperial bureaucracy, had great amount of wealth, of course, as the area around Shanghai was destroyed, his hometown in Suzhou was a mess. He fled to Shanghai and became, becomes part of Shanghai. So, and he becomes a great collector and kind of a publisher of treatises on bronzes and jades. Chugu, an artist from Yangzhou, also ends up in Shanghai. And Shanghai began to develop these artistic societies, these kind of circles, and they become fairly formalized, uh, where you know, if you were an artist that was fleeing from someplace else and came to Shanghai, there was a support structure for you there. There was a place for you to, say, to stay. They would sell your fans in the fan shops. There was a commercial kind of structure to support you. And some of those stories begin to show up here. Here's Shugu moving in. On the other side, it's kind of artistic societies, you have a series of 22 artists who are painting the home of a, of a single important individual. So there are 22 different views of the artist's home. That's the one on, the, on the, of this, this gentleman's home. Uh, so that's what that's about. So these are those kind of artistic circles that developed in Shanghai. And, and there's pretty good information about any number of those. But the whole idea of the Shanghai school, Hai Pai, really starts out as being derogatory from people looking, from you know, the old ed educated elite, from the outside looking in and saying, oh, you're doing these big, bright, bold, splashy, kind of vulgar, whatever you want to call them. But it becomes something that the Shanghai people were quite popular, pr uh, proud of because they're innovative, they're strong, they're bold, and, and they're continuing to produce things that are new and interesting for a you know, period of time. In the 19th century, the late part of the, of the 1800s, you have kind of the national essence people, so people who are looking to reform China, but to re reform it through existing Chinese traditions. And then you have those I think you can only modernize by going outside. So Zhao Zhuqian, uh, the great calligrapher, um, is one of those who sought national essence. So he's one of the great innovators in Chinese calligrapher because he's looking at, in this case, the Bronze Age, and in this case, seal script. So he's looking at 
very ancient scripts to be new and innovative in Chinese calligraphy. Zhao Zhu Chen, in, in many ways, is a, um, a case study in globalization, if you will, or the impact of globalization on China and Shanghai at the end of the, of the 19th century. He, uh, his family was killed during the Taiping rebellions. How many of you know about the foundations of the Taiping rebellions? It was loosely based on Christianity. I mean, it, it was a, you know, the guy was a messiah or meant to be in. So it was loosely based on, so right there, there is a religious kind of globalization going on. Um, and it was finally put down by Colonel Powell leading the ever victorious army. So this British colonel that came and led the ever victorious army, which was a combination of Chinese and, and uh, Western troops, that finally threw it, put it down in 1864. But Zhao Zhuqian's family was, was killed in, by the Taipings, and he fled to Shanghai and became one of the Shanghai artists. And then he died uh, at war with the French. So there's, there's a direct impact of globalization and a negative imp impact of globalization on a very important artist of the uh, late, late 1800s. Issues continued right into the, the, the 20th century, of course. Debates about modernity and such. But there are sub-themes throughout this exhibition. And some of the sub-themes are fun. So the, the painting here that starts the high times section, we've just stepped into the high times section. How many of you know who Kang Yo Wei is? A great reformer, right? A great calligrapher, but also a great reformer. Um, so this is a portrait of Kang Yo Wei's wife, done by Xu Bei Hong. Uh, so one of the great Western, kind of Western style painters of the 20th century. So how would Kang Yo Wei meet Xu Bei Hong? What would be the environment for them to meet? Anybody have any idea? So how would Xu Bei Hong and Kang Yo Wei get to know each other? What was the, what was the, where, where would that happen? <laughs> so the, what, what was, what was, no, that's, there's a very direct answer to that. Kang Yo Wei and Xu Bei Hong were, were, both, were, very, were both closely associated with a man named Hardun, an Iraqi, Iraqi Jew living in Shanghai who had a big mansion and compound. Hardun, Iraqi Jew living in Shanghai who had a big compound out on Bubbling Well Road. And he held these kinds of gatherings for reformers and artists working in Western styles. Liu Hai Su, Kang Yo Wei, Xu Bei Hong, that's where they all got together. So that's where they would have met, likely. I can't say that as a fact, but most likely that's where they would have met. And that's where you know, the possibility of this kind of portrait would have occurred. You also had a Chinese wife to keep up with. Yes, absolutely. So he and his wife were kind of the centers of, of a Western, you know, a Western, well, a change, a change of, exchange of ideas anyway is the way to look at it. So the, the story that we were telling over at the beginning is you know, the trade of you know, opium for tea, right? So, well, that whole trade, the British were pretty clever about things. Even though they were buying tea, you know, they were trading opium for tea, basically, and, and they were still having to buy it. They were still having to pay for it, and they didn't like that. So, of course, they stole the tea plants and took them to uh, Sri Lanka and to southern India, to India, and they established their own tea industry. And by the 1890s, more tea was being exported from India, from South Asia, than from China. And by the early part of the 1900s, Chinese tea had basically been supplanted by others, by teas from, from India, from South Asia. So the, China, the British no longer really needed to sell opium in China. And by 1917, they weren't selling opium in China anymore. It had nothing to do with morality. Basically, these were business people. They were amoral. They didn't care. It wasn't moral, immoral. It was just amoral. They didn't care. Um, so they stopped selling opium, and the Chinese immediately illegalized opium again, but the, the opium business continued, and the people who ran it were these two guys. Uh, this is Du Yasheng and Huan Jinrong, the head of the Green Gang. So opium didn't go away, it just went, it went to uh, a different group of people. So we have, again, some, starting this out with some interesting characters. Kong Yo Wei's wife, the wife of a major reformer, and two gangsters. Huh? So. Artistic debates continue. We have, again, the, the continued kind of back and forth between Shanghai and Japan. Uh, a painting like this, I think you can see some of the, uh, this is somebody who studied in Japan, was looking for Western, kind of Western styles and how to incorporate them into a, a national style, national style painting, and does that through the filter of Japan. I think you can see that in this, in this Plum Blossom painting. Is there, everybody's pretty comfortable with that. 
Lin Feng Mian, who was a very serious uh, student in Paris, and then came back and began doing, uh, you know, again, Guahua, national style paintings, but with very direct kind of references to his experiences in the West. So I look at this and I see Matisse and Modigliani, most of Modigliani, I suppose, in the face of the figure. Uh, you look at his, his landscape over here and you see, again, it looks like kind of a Mifu or something like that, but there's also a vanishing point. There's kind of, there, there's a back and forth between the, his, his studies in the West and his native traditions. So there's a lot of that kind of going on and there's these artistic debates about how, how to modernize the, the arts of China. And that goes in ink painting and that goes on down the way into oil painting. And so now we have this section where it uh, we continue our narrative of um, vi the visualization of women in Shanghai's visual arts. And so guests can certainly just move from that session into here without a hitch, I guess. And so uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, the most popular form or the most common form of um, visualizations of Chinese women are in these posters. And um, another popular form, which we don't have, is the calendar poster, whereby you would have the image of the woman. Underneath, you would have the month, the calendar for whatever month it was, or actually all 12 months of the year. And then surrounding her image would be the product that she is selling, that she is helping to sell, either cigarettes or alcohol, or even medicine. And so uh, with these images, we are trying to have people consider a few different issues. One of them is that uh, these images, as a collective, represent different um, representations of what was considered a modern woman at that time. And so one of the questions, one of the main questions we ask is, well, what from these images, what, what's considered modern for a modern woman. And in general, the modern woman appeared to be um, updated on the latest fashions and styles, and so she, has, she appears perfectly coiffed and dressed. She also appears be, uh, with her poses as self-confident and composed. And then, also, she seems to have more access to public spaces. For example, she could be lounging poolside or um, seaside, or she could be seen dancing at a dance hall, or we have those two prints right there of um, the big four department stores and also the Great World Amusement Center, which are, which are also other forms of public spaces that now the modern woman could be seen out and about. But then we have, on the other side, domestic images. So we see the modern woman in her home setting, but yet with the sheer fact that these, the home setting is now being printed and distributed, her domestic life is being publicized as well. And so again, she is perfectly coiffed and dressed and poised and one poster which I want to highlight would be this one. It's called The Course of a Marriage. And so in the center you have the happy couple on their wedding day, while around them you have four um, snapshots of their different life stages. So you have them as children where they first meet, and then during their school years where they continue to support each other, then they get married, then they have children, which is referred to as love's reward, and then later on they age in retirement, happy together. Now this poster actually points to many different things, many different um, themes that we can also relate with other objects in this exhibition. So for example, you see here the picture, the idealized picture of the nuclear family, which is mother, father, child, and children. And the nuclear family is a, it is a new type of um, family system that is different from traditional, the traditional Chinese family system of several generations under one roof. And so now with this nuclear family system, in a way it's dictated by the urban environment of Shanghai at that time. So you have smaller families now living in smaller um, apartment units. And so we have 
for example, which I will point out later, an oil painting, a contemporary oil painting of these characteristic um, townhouses and residential units that um, emerged because of the urban environment. But then also, um, they also represent a rising middle class. And so the gentleman here is dressed in a Western suit. So we have deco furniture, we have the coat tree from which he might hang his suit or his overcoat. And so in a way we can make many different references to other objects in the exhibition. So it's a, it's a very rich poster for that. So they range from the 1920s for these three and then the 1930s for the last two. And you know, the Chi Pao dress was synonymous with the Republican um, regime, which is from 1912 to 1949. Um, because once the Communist Party took over, uh, such a garment was frowned upon and you see more androgynous um, fashions after that. And so the 1920s Chi Pao was more box-like. It hung from the shoulder in almost a straight line while the 1930s Chi Pao's are more fitted to the female curve. And you, know, you can look at these fashions as just something capricious or just something fun to look at, but uh, scholars are also looking into the history of the style changes and asking whether or not there's more behind these style changes. Um, for example, uh, in traditional Chinese fashion, the female, there's also, there's a saying, I think it's um, yi nan er nu, or something like, to that effect, where it's um, one for the male, two for the woman, meaning the male wears, if you recall, they wear this one piece flowing robe. That is the dress of a, um, a traditional scholar, educated um, gentleman. While the female, the, at least the Han Chinese female, wear two pieces, a jacket and a skirt. But now you see the cheap house here, which is all one piece. And so some scholars are saying, well, that's just the woman wanting to follow the men. And, and interestingly, we actually, for our next uh, China rotation, which goes up in, on March 1st, we're actually including a cheap pao from uh, the late 1800s. And the cheap pao is actually of Manchu origin. And so you have a Manchu garment now becoming the 1920s, 1930s as a characteristic Chinese modern garment. So it's an, that is a very intriguing history right there. An answer in part to that, that question. Um, Shanghai became a, a treaty port because China had something that nobody else had and everybody wanted. And that had been kind of the, the, the nature of the relationship with China and the rest of the world for a long, long time. China had products that nobody else had, be it silk, be it porcelain, or be it tea. But by the turn of the century, by 1900, um, the situation was very, very different. Um, the best silks were being produced in Japan. The best metalwork was being produced in Japan. China was no longer exporting tea. Most of the tea was coming from India. So by 1900, that situation had reversed itself that the world didn't need anything from China anymore. Uh, and Shanghai, you know, there was a whole different reason for Shanghai existing after that point. And you know, the very best silks were being made in Japan, and they were being imported, imported from Japan to China, think of that, uh, to make these cheap out. So an interesting kind of, the whole kind of world for the Chinese was just totally topsy-turvy, uh, if you think of it that way. Um, if you read the catalog, there was a pretty clear patronage base and, and a system for Chinese style, you know, Gua Hua, national style paintings to move around. There were patrons, there were fan shops, there, were, you know, there, was, there was a commercial structure there to support that kind of artistic activity. There wasn't that much of a support structure, a clear support structure for oil painting. Um, these people were really trying to innovate, they were really revolutionaries. They were, they were people that were doing something very, very new. But there wasn't, for this kind of painting, unlike the China trade paintings, there wasn't a direct market in the West. 
Uh, there wasn't much of a market amongst the Chinese, the, the traditional Chinese or many Chinese. There wasn't much of a market. So these paintings have, haven't survived in great numbers. We were lucky to find a private collector who had managed to put together a, a decent group of them. But there are not huge numbers, not like, unlike Chinese uh, style paintings, where there are huge numbers of Shanghai School paintings around. There are not many oil paintings. We had a trouble finding them. Also, because there was not that kind of support structure, they didn't have great pigments. They didn't have great canvas. They didn't know how to properly stretch a canvas. So these things are really fragile. Um, our conservator just went absolutely, she was freaked out as she looked at a lot of them because they're, they're very, very fragile. Uh, just the nature of the materials are not, that's not great oil. They're not well adhered to the canvas. That canvas isn't properly stretched. There are a lot of problems here. But in that, they still did really wonderful and interesting things. And there were obviously artistic debates, even amongst those who were trying to modernize Chinese painting or Chinese art through the Western, uh, Western styles. And two good examples are Xu Bei Hong. We've already seen his portrait of Kang Youwei's wife. Xu Bei Hong studied in Europe, and he was very much in favor of the academic styles as practiced in the salons in Paris and Germany. Liu Haisu, on the other hand, uh, who did this work, was influenced by post, uh, post impressionists by Van Gogh. And, and Guanzulian, the, the woman artist over here who did the little still life, she studied Fauvist painting in Japan, Fauvist styles. So, they were decades behind what was, what was new and contemporary in Europe, but even there, there was a debate about how you should modernize Chinese, Chinese art and what was the right way to go about it. As I read about the different personalities, and that's one of the great things about this time in Chinese history, there's a lot known about these people, and they lived a long time. Liu Haisu lived from what was, from, I, mean, I think he was 96 years old when he died, so he lived through, you know, incredibly, 1896 to 1990, 1890, 1994, Long, long time, interesting times, in 80, you know, 90 odd years, almost 100 years. Uh, they were, yeah. <laughs> so, a fascinating life history, and we've got, you know, three, three works by him from different periods in his life and in different styles, but I think I would have liked Liu Haisu. I think he was a rebel, and I think he would have been a, a real kick. I mean, he got in big trouble for introducing the nude in, into the, his, his studio. Um, he was always doing something. He started the Shanghai Academy of Art and was kind of a, a center of the Shanghai art community and was really loyal to his city. So even after there was a lot of trouble in the, in the 50s, he continued to be very loyal to his city. So this is Liu, this is Liu Haisu here, this, this view this of, of the Bund. Uh, Xu Bei Hong, I think he would have been a stuffed shirt. I don't think I like Xu Bei Hong that much. <laughs> so uh, kind of difference in personalities. This image is a fun one because it is, he had to have been in the Broadway mansions, and we'll see a photograph of the Broadway mansions, looking down at the Garden Bridge. I mean, I, I bet we can almost tell the room that he was in when he started, started this, this painting. So, and he's looking down again at the, at the bun. The painting is dirty, the surface of the painting is dirty, and that's one of the reasons, you know, the, it's from a private collection. It's not, it probably would be much, much brighter if we were able to clean it, but we were not able to do that. Artist, the owner did not want us to do that, but it's a really wonderful painting, 1956, so, a time when, you know, that's a great leap forward. That's a difficult time in Shanghai. People tend to think of Shanghai as the only place that this, this kind of thing happened. These were made in Tianjin, which is up closer to Beijing. And there was trade back and forth. Uh, China, the China Steamship uh, Company, there's trading back and forth between Shanghai and other treaty ports. Uh, there were other treaty ports that were making materials like this. So there was a movement, there were movements that were, you see in Shanghai, that also were in other areas like Tianjin. These rugs could very well have been into a Shanghai house, but they were, they were definitely made in Tianjin. So this is about other treaty ports. That's just the rugs, the rugs in this room. The furniture is from the Shanghai, so what's so-called Shanghai Deco. And to talk about that, <clears throat> the way I would, I would, as a person giving a tour, I would start with, with this particular building. And there may be other, this photograph, because it's of a building that, that kind of tells the story in a, in a pretty good way, at least in, in, in a way. If you look at images of the Bund, um, 1860, you see it's mostly trading ports, uh, trading offices, warehouses, residences of the trading companies that were trading in Shanghai. By 1920, most of the architecture along the Bund was uh, Beaux Arts, and the buildings were huge. They were banks, they were customs houses, they were hotels, but they were they were different kinds of structures. They were commercial structures. They were serious, big, monumental. They were the same kind of architectural style as this building, which is kind of interesting. 
But that style was kind of of the 20s. And as you get into the later part of the 20s, Shanghai became interested in being more modern. Not about this old kind of classical Beaux-Arts stuff, but being more modern. And that then becomes what we call Shanghai Deco. Now, Shanghai Deco was like the Silk Road. It's a construct. There wasn't such a thing as Shanghai Deco in 1920s and 1930s China. They were looking to be modern. So they were borrowing from all kinds of different movements. Uh, Streamline Modern, which is Streamline Modern, which is what this is. It all now is called Shanghai Deco, and that's fine. It's a good brand. It gives us something to work with. This building gives a pretty good example of how the styles would have been getting to Shanghai, and an interesting kind of story about it. So this is, uh, the money comes from the Sassoon family, Victor Sassoon, an Iraqi Jew living in Shanghai, just like Hardoon over in the far side. So that's where the money comes from. Uh, the architects are Palmer and Turner. And Palmer and Turner had been the architects for a lot of the buildings along the Buns in the 20s and 30s. And actually Sassoon had been the patron for a lot of those buildings as well. But um, obviously they're looking at a different style now. They're doing Streamline Modern. So rather than doing Beaux-Arts, they're doing Streamline Modern. Just like a building that would have been built in New York at the same time. So we have that, uh, Palmer and Turner, they have a new architect that they've hired to come in and do, to do this one, a uh, different style. So we have the movements occurring in New York and occurring in Shanghai at almost the same time, but it's a very kind of international movement, if you will. We have you know, uh, Iraqi Jew as the patron, we have uh, an architect who's European as the designer, as the architect and engineer. Uh, we have, of course, a Chinese construction company being built that way. And the main, the main occupants of this building were the, the wealthy British, so at least until 37. So it will mix up. But amongst the Chinese, of course, as soon as they saw this, this is something that they become interested in. We're going to be modern. We're going to do something that's different, that's modern. So they began to interpret and work with these styles. And there are any number of deco, so-called deco buildings throughout Shanghai in this period. So we see them as, as uh, gas stations, service stations. We see them as hotels. We see all kinds of deco styles being, buildings being built in, in, in Shanghai. And we also see furniture in so-called deco styles, Shanghai deco styles, furnishing these, these buildings. Uh, and there are a lot of residences in these styles. Some of those residences were the residences of Europeans. Others were Chinese residents. So then we get into this kind of interesting and tricky issue of the national goods movement. And patriotism and, and modernity and the national goods movement all kind of melding together. And there are a lot of stories that go with that and a lot of things you can talk about. Now the national good movement, one of the very first events that leads to this national good, goods movement happens in 1908. So what happens in 1908? Film. Film has very little to do with it. In 1908, the Americans re-up the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that just ticks off the Shanghaiese. I mean, what, I would be too. You just can't come here. You're not welcome. We're not going to allow you into our country. If, even if you live here, man, you're not welcome. So the Chinese are unhappy about that. 1919, you have the uh, Treaty of Versailles. You have the May Movement of 1919. You have, the, again, the Westerners giving away big parts of China to Japan. So again, there's this, oh, we don't like this. So there's this kind of national goods movement coming along and a growing sense of nationalism, a growing sense of being patriotic. And there are those kinds of international incidents that occur for that period. 1918 is one of the early ones. All the way through 1913, there was something about the British attacking uh, Chinese workers in Shanghai. All the way through. So it becomes, the Chinese become more and more interested in being patriotic, in being modern, but also in being Chinese.